I'd like for us to begin reading in verse number 9, if we could. Of course, this is the writings of Paul. And uh, we're going to begin in verse number 9, chapter 15, 1 Corinthians. Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles. Now remember these phrases and these thoughts because they're going to become very important in the message. I am the least of the apostles that I am not meet or worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain Please notice this phrase. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Very simply he's saying I worked harder than any of the apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Several years ago, I just became very interested in reading some books on training horses. They say, Preacher, why on earth did you get involved? I don't know. I just did. And I got very interested in the training of racehorses. Read several books on that and and, uh, enjoyed all of them and learned something from all of them. But there's one book that described a certain type of race that took place, and it was called a handicap race. Now, some of y'all are nodding your head. You, you've been way too much time at the racetrack. <laughs> I was hoping everybody would say, a what? <laughs> but it's called a handicap race. And that is when you have horses of different degrees of experience. You may have some very young horses that might be their first race. You have other horses that have have a lot of experience and they've won races and they, they just have much more uh, uh, going for them than the other horses. And so to level the playing field, they take weights. The track steward determines the amount of weight and they take a weight and they place it on that experienced horse's shoulders and give him a handicap. From what I read, it could be up to 14 pounds. Now You may not realize it, but a pound or two makes a world of difference in a race. The jockey will try to weigh about 103 pounds. And if he weighs over that, he goes on diet. Because just a pound or two could change everything. And these horses, they lay this burden on their shoulders to give them a handicap. The book said that the trainers and the jockeys know their horses. And some horses, when that weight is laid on their shoulders, they'll have one of two responses. Some horses just slump and they give up right there. They know that they've been given this burden they're going to have to carry and, and it's going to be an uphill climb and they just, they just give up when they feel the burden laid on them. And they say that other horses, when they feel that burden laid on their shoulders, the jockey can sense in that horse that he's reaching down and getting a little more. Instead of making him want to give up, it makes him try a little harder. And he just determines, this is not going to slow me up. Paul said in these verses, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. I persecuted the church of Christ. And what a burden that is. 
Paul realized it all of his life and he referenced it often. I persecuted. I I played havoc upon the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, that's a burden I've got to bear. But I didn't slump. He said, I reached down and I worked harder than anybody. Not that I did it, but the grace of God did it in me. And he said, I determined that my handicap would not hinder me, but provoke me. You may be sitting here this morning, and I'm going to go over five handicaps that Paul had. And to get it in one message, I'm going to have to go quickly. But I want to reference five handicaps that the Scripture gives us that Paul had. And every one of them, he could have give up. He could have just quit. He could have slumped. But every one of them motivated Paul to go on in spite of the handicap. The first handicap I'll mention is this. Paul had a physical handicap. If you read about Paul, he was blinded. His eyes were so bad that someone else had to write his letters. His eyes were so bad that they were actually kind of a reproachful thing about his appearance. And uh, he told one church, he said, I'm so glad you were not ashamed of my eyes. You would have taken your eyes out and given them to me if you could have. And so Paul had a terrible handicap of eyesight. And you know what? Most of us, if we were to lose our sight, would slump. We'd say, all right, if that's the way it is, I'm not going to try anymore. I'm just going to, I'm just going to resign myself to a very limited situation, I, and, and, and I'm going to blame God for this problem. And I'm, you know what? You may not have an eyesight problem, but there's many people in here today got a physical problem. Yeah. Amen. Amen. They just come along. And you know what? The older you get, the more prone you are to have those things. And sometimes they're just laid on us. But what I'm trying to say this morning is if God allows a handicap of physical uh, impairment to be laid on us, let's not slump and quit and want to pout. Let's say, God, help me just dig a little deeper and serve you anyway. A lot of people serve with physical handicaps. I remember probably 40 years ago, 5, 46, 48 years ago, I try to relate to Carolyn's age when I give up with these numbers. (laughs) Probably about 48 years ago, a young man came to our church. They, They announced he was going to come, he was going to play a guitar, and he was going to sing. His name was Richard Miller. And everybody was looking forward to seeing him. And here he came down the aisle in a wheelchair. He had no legs. He had no arms. He put rubber bands under stubs here, and that's what he played the guitar with. And he sang a song, Jesus, use me. Oh, Lord, don't refuse me. Though my gifts may be few. Are you listening? He did not slump under the handicap, but he allowed God to use that in his life to bless other people. When Paul prayed, God, please take this handicap away. He said, three times I prayed. And and the Lord said, Paul, I'm not taking it away. You're better off with it. Paul didn't slump and pout and threaten to quit God. He simply said, therefore will I glory in my infirmities. If in my weakness your strength is made perfect, Paul would have never dug that deep into his soul and come up with the strength of the Holy Spirit to do what he did if he'd never had that handicap. He'd never done it. So if you've got a physical handicap today, amen, it's part of what God's plan for your life is, and evidently he's going to use it if you'll let him use it If you'll dig down instead of slumping, the handicap can be a blessing. The the second handicap was a handicap of 
uh, social handicap. Think about it with me. Uh, Acts 9, 26. Let me read this verse. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Paul, for a long, long time, had a social handicap. That was when he got around social people, they were afraid of him and walked off and left him. Now, you say, preacher, I've had my feelings hurt. Well, God bless your heart. <laughs> Amen. Well, everybody don't like me like I think they ought to. I heard about a fellow some time ago. He, he went to the doctor and he said, doctor, I, I, I just have an inferiority complex. I don't know. So the doctor analyzed and had several sessions and finally come up. He said, I know your problem. He said, what's my problem? He said, you're inferior. Are you listening? You don't have to be the bell of the ball and the life of the party to do something for God. Amen. Well, preacher, I'm just a shy person. Well, Paul, they, they shunned him. They were afraid of him. They wouldn't gather where he was at. You know what they thought he was, or literally? They thought he was a Roman spy. He's here to, to spy out the churches and report back to Rome and have us all destroyed. You say, I, I don't have the personality you have. Thank God for your blessings, all right? <laughs> it's not in personality, ladies and gentlemen. It's in the power of the Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah. And you can be an introvert. You can be so shy. You can be so backward. And yet if the Spirit of God uses what you say and do, it'll be greatly used. Amen. Don't let that social handicap discourage you. I, I know that some people say, I'm just not wired to, to be outgoing and meet people and all that sort of thing. Uh, you've got a way that you can serve God and be blessed. Amen. Amen. You don't have to be a socialite to hand out a track. Amen. Yeah. Well, preacher, I'm just, I, no, no. All you've got, you don't even have to smile. It helps to hand out a track. <laughs> But you don't have to be Mr. Personality to leave a track on the table for the waitress. Amen. Amen. So, preacher, do you do that? I don't do that a whole lot to waitresses because they all know me. Amen. Some people have jail ministries. We have restaurant ministries. Amen. And we, we go often and stay late. Waitresses, when they come up to our table, they come with her a sweet tea, me a glass of water, and extra lemon. They know what we want, and they all respect us. And most of them call me Reverend Parker, Pastor Parker. I go through the McDonald's, and there's a young man there that I, I don't know who he is. I, I'm sorry, forgive me. And somebody's going to say, "That's my son." You don't know it. I'm sorry, but every morning when I drive through there, or any morning I drive through there, I don't go through there often. But any morning I go through there, he says, Pastor Parker, hope you have a good day. Amen. You know, I'm just, you don't have to have a glowing personality. I'm going to be honest. Most of us would not have really liked Paul a great deal. He did not have that personable spirit. We, we would have probably, I mean, he was... History tells us uh, a, a, what would be called, I, I hope I'm not being incorrect here, but a, a hunchback. He, he was drawn over, and he was almost blind, and he was very direct. Yeah. He was very plain. Most of us would say, I don't like that old man. <laughs> Amen. You got that beat. If you can see well and walk straight, you got Paul beat. He had a social handicap. And, and then thirdly, Paul had an emotional handicap. Now, most people don't see it this way. Now, don't you, don't you shout right here or say, man, when I say it, tell you Paul's emotional handicap. Paul didn't have a wife. He didn't have somebody to go home to. He didn't have somebody to encourage him. Everybody else, when they went to their family, Paul had no family to go to. 
Can I tell you something? That's a handicap. You may not believe that, but that's a handicap. Paul said, I've given it up that I might better serve God. And he said it in a way, I realize what I'm sacrificing. I realize what I'm giving up. I, I don't count that lightly, but it's all for the furtherance of the gospel. And he said, I'm willing to live my life without anybody patting me on the back, without anybody having the meals, without anybody saying, Paul, I love you, without having anybody to go home to. Paul had none of those things. He said, I, I just feel like I can serve God better if I'm by myself. I'm not trying to get close home. But there's people sitting here this morning you're by yourself. The husband's gone. The wife's gone. Maybe through death or divorce or whatever. And the devil's saying, why don't you just slump? Why don't you just quit? Why don't you just lay it down? Why don't you just give it up? Nobody's expecting you to carry this burden. And, and, and everybody will understand why you just... Tell Miss Carolyn you can't work anymore. Tell the pastor you can't teach anymore. Tell the choir director you can't sing anymore. Just have you a pity party. Or you can say, Lord, thank you for the time I had with the one I had. Now, God, I'm going to dig a little deeper. And it's just me. And the Lord says, no, it's not just you. It's you and me. Yeah, good. Amen. And so don't, don't let that, that emotional handicap. But preacher, you don't know what it's like to go home by yourself. I agree that. I, 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 I'm not going to say I can understand the feelings of losing a husband or losing a wife. I'm not going to minimize that. But I am saying that there's a grace of God sufficient for your need. Amen. 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 And when the best thing in the world is get involved in the work of God and don't quit and don't, don't listen to the devil. Uh, I, I've told you this story before, but it's so designed for this thought. A lady came to Jack Howes one time and he told Dr. Howes, she said, please pray for me. I'm, I'm having a nervous breakdown. And he said, well, I'm so sorry. Uh, you know, she said, just, just tell me something. Give me something to hold on to. Tell me what I need to do. And he said, go home and make some cookies. And she said, don't make fun of this. He said, I'm not making fun. I'm your pastor and I love you. Do you trust me? Well, I do. Then go home and make some cookies. So she went home and she told this story, give this testimony. She went home, made a batch of cookies and set them up there, and she said, now what? And she looked outside, and there were some kids playing. She said, okay. She went out and took those cookies to the kids. And you know what happened when you took a pan Amen. of cookies Amen. to the kids. Amen. Man, I mean, they, they didn't stay there as long as Fanny stayed in the Army. Excuse me, that, <laughs> that's, an old, that's an old expression. Cookies were gone. One little boy come up and said, uh, thank you for the cookies, but could I have maybe two more? And she said, honey, are you hungry? He said, no, no. But that's my mother's favorite cookie. She's got cancer, and she can't cook anymore. I just want to take her to it. He said, where do you live? She made a pan full of cookies and took to that mother. And she started making pan full of cookies. Two months later, she was in the church, and Dr. Howe saw her and said, how's the nervous breakdown going? She said, I don't have time. I'm making cookies. <laughs> you know what we can do? We can slump or we can dig down. 
Paul had a spiritual handicap. <laughs> Pretty sure there's anybody in the world had no spiritual handicap. It was Paul. Yeah, he did. Romans 7. You know the chapter. Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I know I shouldn't be doing, I find myself doing them. The things that I know displease God, and I, now I'm reading between the lines here, I promise I'll never do again. I find myself doing them. The things at the end of the day I knew I was supposed to do, I didn't do them all. And he said, oh, wretched man that I am. What's the answer? Even though I'm saved, born again, a child of God, I'm still in this flesh. And he said, one day God will deliver me from this flesh. Let me ask you this, and you don't have to raise your hand. How many of y'all get discouraged over the same old sin? Amen. Amen. I'm not going to tell you what they are, but I've got things I battle. And it's not something new every day. Maybe yours is something new every day. Mine's the same blessed thing every day. <laughs> Lord, you know what we can do? We can get so defeated and say, I'm not fit to do anything for God. I'm not worthy. Paul said, I'm the least of the apostles. Not worthy to be called an apostle. I persecute. Have you ever persecuted the house of God? Well, no. Well, you're ahead of Paul. And sometimes we get so discouraged. I knew a, I knew a man. Now, there might be one or two people in here know who I'm talking about. Maybe three or four. Godly Christian couple. I'm talking about love the Lord. Served in church. Very active. Taught Sunday school work buses, and, and just very, very active. And one day they came to me and said, we're resigning our positions. We won't be back. And I said, what in the world? What, what have I done? Oh, it's not you, preacher. You've not done anything. Well, have you been offended? No. And, and they didn't want to talk about it. Now, now if you want to give a preacher gray hair, you just leave and won't tell him why, what's going on. And he thinks, what did we do? A couple of months later, he came to apologize, and he said, we're not coming back. We're not going to church anywhere. But I did feel like I needed to tell you. He said, you know our daughter? I said, yeah. She was giving him fits. And he lost it one night and spanked her beyond what he should have. Would you have called it abuse? I don't know. I didn't see it. But he said, I just lost it. And he said, if I can't control myself with my own children, why should anybody trust me around their children? Yeah. He said, I won't be back to church. You know what he did? He let one mistake and the devil eliminate him from serving God. That's why the Bible says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The devil will come along and say, you got no business. Look what you did. You're a Christian and look what you did. Can I tell you, listen to me, a Christian can do anything a non-Christian can do under the right circumstances and, and will do it, but by the grace of God. You say, a Christian couldn't do this. A Christian could. You're not a Christian because of what you can and can't do. You're a Christian because of the blood of Christ. Now let me say this, a Christian can't do it and get by with it. Amen. Amen. But that discouraged, that, that handicap laid around, and I can imagine that man laying in bed at night and weeping and saying, man, did I drop the ball? Did I drop the ball? And the devil told him, you can never serve again. You can never serve again. We've got to go on. 
in Philippians chapter 1, Paul admitted and he said, I have a geographical handicap. A geographical handicap. He said, to go and be with Jesus is far better. But to stay here is more needful for you. And so his handicap was he stayed here even though he'd like to be there. Amen. Now, how many people have I met that have said, Preacher, I don't know why God hadn't taken me. I don't know why God hadn't taken And you know, they're expecting me to tell them why God hadn't taken them. My answer is, I don't know either, but he has a reason. He has a reason. Wouldn't it be nice if, uh, well, maybe it wouldn't be. I don't know. But I'm just thinking, if we had in control of all these things, but you know how stupid we are? It's a good thing we're not in control of everything. You know what? That's God's business. You just trust God and say, God, if I've got a year left, if I've got 10 years left, or like Miss Carol, got 40 more years left, amen, amen, then I'm going to serve God. I may not can do what I did 10 years ago, but I can do more probably now than I'll be doing in 10 years from now. So let's get busy about doing something right now. Amen. Amen. We, we want to be able to just uh, go through those gates and say, I have finished my course. Amen. I was talking to a preacher the other day about a, famous preacher down in the south, pastor of Northside Baptist Church, Charlotte, North Carolina, and he was preaching to the Southwide Baptist Fellowship, Dr. Jack Hudson, and he had arthritis real, real bad, and he was stooped over the last years of his life and had to look up and shake hands with you like this. Sweet, dear man. And uh, he was supposed to preach at Southwide the first message of the morning service, and the moderator come up and said, uh, Dr. Hudson's here in Louisville, but... Uh, he can't get here. He's had a flare-up of the arthritis. But he sent the title of his message. And he just wanted me to read the title of his message. He said he was going to preach on this thought, how to keep from losing the game in the fourth quarter. How many people have you ever known that stayed faithful and true to God right up to very close to the end and then just got silent? got bitter, got discouraged. You know what? There isn't anything sweeter than a sweeter old person. Say amen. 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 Isn't anything sweeter than a sweet... There isn't anything meaner than a mean old person either. (laughs) You know what we need to determine? God just make me sweeter and sweeter. God don't let me get ill and mean and hard to live with. God, there's children I can do something for. There's young people I can do something for. I still have something to offer. I have some wisdom that people who have not gone through what I went through don't have. Amen. God, help me to be there for them if they want it. Amen. That's just five things. Could probably mention 20. Sometimes there's a financial handicap. Amen. All kinds of handicaps. The important thing is not what kind of handicap it is. The important thing is what are you going to do when you feel it laid on your shoulders? And you realize this is not a 24-hour bug. I may be carrying this the rest of my life. What are you going to do? You're going to slump? You're going to quit? You're going to back off? Or are you going to do like Paul said, I worked harder. I just worked harder because of my handicap.